Oh, God, would you let those birds just sing that peace for that moment. And as we gather here in your name, O oh Lord, would you open up our hearts to receive your word and our minds to be receptive to it and our ears be tuned to your truth that we might become more and more like Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, a number of years ago, it was very early in my ministry, I found myself thinking these words that probably all of us at some point in our life have uttered, and they're this. I wish I had more time. I imagine all of us have said that because they're very popular words, and what you find is as you think through things, after a while, they come out of your mouth. And sometimes they come out of your mouth at really the most inopportune moments. And I happened to be hanging out with one of my friends who's a few years older, but a whole lot more wiser than I will ever be. And I remember sort of lamenting with him as we're just sort of going through and talking. And I said, man, I'm, I'm so busy. I just wish I had more time. And he stopped and he sort of looked at me, that quizzical kind of look that he has. And he said, for what? I don't know what I was really expecting. I wasn't expecting a question is what I wasn't expecting. I, you know, I was expecting like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Yeah, this must be tough being busy and uh, a little sympathy or compassion. What I wasn't expecting was a question. And he wasn't going to let me get off without answering the question. And so there I'm left and I'm thinking, uh, for what? Uh, so I can do more stuff. <laughs> So I can cram more things into my already busy life. And he sort of looked at me and had a goofy smile on his face. He said, so why do you feel the need to cram more stuff into your already busy life? Because I feel more significant when my calendar's full. <laughs> and you just have that moment of truth and honesty. I just couldn't, you know, just came out of my mouth. And I'm like, man, that's, that's it. <laughs> And I don't know what drives you, because we do live in a world that seems to honor type A driven personalities, and we sort of lift, lift that up as, as almost the ideal way to live. And, and let me just tell you, in case you think the church is perfect at that, the church actually, I think, sometimes is worse at it because we have this altruistic motive, like, well, I'm doing it for God. Don't you understand? You can sacrifice time more without me, family. I'm doing it for Jesus. That's what it's... And we have all the great reasons, um, but it's not the godly way to live. And I love this about our God, because our God um, decided that one of the uh, commands, one of the words from God as Moses came down from the mountain after 400 years, if you can be with me on this, 400 years in captivity, being slaves in Egypt, that they didn't have a day off. They didn't get vacation time or benefits or sick days. They worked all the time. And one of the things, as Moses comes down the mountain and he recites to them these words that God gave him on the tablets, one of them says this, thou shalt takest a day offeth. That's well, not quite the way it's worded, but that's sort of the meaning behind it. It's remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Could you imagine what that sounds like? Because I know in our culture, like day off, man, we get two a week. You get, most people get weekends off. It's wonderful. You get two days off. They lived in a world where they got zero. And so to go from zero to no, you're going to take a day. And I love how God closes the loopholes because he knew the tendency of the human heart. Because, oh, take a day off, I'll take a day off. Hey, honey, I can't do it. Can you bring, yeah, that'd be great. Bring that over. No, no, your wife doesn't get to work either. Okay, kids, can you do that? No, kids don't get to work. Servant, no, servants don't get to work. Foreigners, don't even try to call a foreigner who doesn't believe in me. I don't care. Nobody works. Not your animals, nobody gets to work. It's a holy day. <sighs> Build some margin in your life. You would have think over the years after hearing that, that they would have done a better job of building some margin in their life, but they didn't. And so we're going to fast forward into Jesus's life and give you just a little bit of backdrop. This is early in Jesus's ministry, and he had just sent out 
the disciples two by two to go into the towns and the villages and, and preach repentance. And they would go and they'd anoint people and they would go and cast out demons and they would heal people and, and everybody was talking about it. And they're coming back, the Bible says, and telling Jesus everything that they'd done. And then they're, they're busy going off and going out. Now, we got to do this again. This was awesome to you. I'll be back with more stories. And they're going off and so much excitement is going on. And this is where we pick up our text. Listen to this. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them. Now, I pause there because I want you to think about what would you say in that moment? I mean, if you're a good leader, this is the time to capitalize on Big Mo, right? You got momentum in your favor. (laughs) Things are moving. You got disciples who are excited. They're ready to go out and do this again. This is a time to sort of rally the troops and, man, keep it up. Great job. Let's go get them. There's more people who are dying. There's more people who need to be healed. There's more demons to cast out. There's more people who need to repent. Let's go and get this word out. And so what Jesus said to them is, we've got so much to do, uh, we can eat later. It's not really what it says, in case you were wondering, like, really? That's an, I don't remember that ever being in the Bible. It's not in the Bible, by the way. That's why you should have a Bible and read it, so I'm not just making stuff up for you. Here's actually, you're like, does he do that all the time? Yes, I do this a lot, um, just putting that just to make sure you're awake. Here's what Jesus really said. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Let's put a little margin in there. And again, this doesn't make sense, does it? Because this is not what we would teach. This is not probably the way we would act if we're Jesus. And you got disciples who are excited and things are happening. So if you're smart, and I believe you are smart because you're here, that you're going to want to know the answer to this question. What does Jesus know that I don't know? Why would he act in a way that I wouldn't act? What does he know that I don't know? And that's what I want to describe for you today because I could give you a time management seminar today and that would be really exciting for a lot of you and give you some tips and here's how you run your calendar. I've been to those time management seminars back before they were digital, you know, the old day timer kind of thing. Anybody in that era, remember those little day timer things that you were afraid to lose because your whole life it was on a calendar and if it got lost, you were in deep trouble. Um, I lived in that world and was so detailed with that. What does Jesus know that I don't know? We're not giving you a time management seminar. We're talking about Jesus today because that's, I assume, what you want to hear about. So that's what I'm going to tell you about today. What does Jesus know? He knows three things. And the first thing that Jesus knows is there is an eternity. (laughs) There is an eternity that we don't have to get so caught up in right now and this moment because there is an eternity that God has established. And so even Jesus, before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I've always been. He was there at the creation of the world. He's coming back again. There's never been a time Jesus was not. And so there's an eternity. And so Jesus lives with an eternal perspective. You know, as we're putting the series together, one of the things that sort of amazed me as I was trying to think, I'm like, I don't ever remember Jesus being stressed. I don't ever remember Jesus going through life like, oh man, come on, we got to get this in a hurry. And if there's anybody who ever should have been stressed, I'm thinking it should have been Jesus. I mean, I've got three years on this earth to walk with you and to teach you knuckleheads about the kingdom of God. So come on, sit down, put the rock down, Peter, stop playing, take some notes. I got to turn this thing over to you and I'm worried because you're not getting it. Come on, let's go over this again. And you never see that in scriptures. Why? Because Jesus knew, knew there was an eternity. It's not just about right now. And so Jesus said, build in some margins. And you think, well, that'd be great, except I'm not Jesus. I'm not God. I don't have an eternal perspective. Well, you do, kind of. Ecclesiastes says it this way. He says, uh, he has put eternity in the human heart that you have this. You have this DNA inside of you that God set something in your heart that's set on eternities that no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We don't understand everything. We don't have the mind of God. God didn't give us that. But what he did give us is that little piece of each one of us that says, there's got to be something more to this life than just this life. And so even people who don't follow Jesus wrestle with this. Is, is there something more? Is there more life than just what we exist now or is it, is it just done? Well, that comes from God. He set that in our heart to bring us closer to him, to help build some margin in our life. So everybody gets this. 
Second thing that Jesus knows is that God wants to spend eternity with you. And I know that's a very elementary truth of the Bible, and most of us have heard something along these lines if you grew up in church, that God wants to spend eternity with you. That's why Jesus came into the world, to die in your place, that you would be set free, that you can experience heaven. But I don't think a lot of us live that way. And maybe deep down, there's some of us that don't really believe that. And to me, that's still mind-blowing. That there is a God who spoke and the world came into existence. There's a God, all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal God that created each one of us unique and different. And that same God says, you know what? I desire more than anything else. I desire to spend eternity with you. And I know that gets old for some people, but that still blows my mind that we have that kind of God that loves us that much, that wants to spend eternity with us. Look at the way he says this in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as son understands slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Who's included in everyone? Everyone. You're included in that everyone. God wanted everybody he created to spend eternity with him. And this is where I run into every once in a while a conversation with a non-believer. And I'll hear something like, how could a loving God ever send somebody to hell? And I like answering questions with questions because it's been used against me. And so I like to turn that around and do that for other people every once in a while. And so when I hear that question, one of the things I say, well, is it really loving if somebody spends their whole life choosing to live apart from God on their own choice, to then for eternity say, nope, you get to spend it with me. I know you didn't want to be with me on the earth, but now you're going to spend it with me for eternity. (laughs) Is that really loving? Well, no. I mean, if you choose not to be with God, why would you want to be with God for eternity? Now, it doesn't change God's heartbeat because God's heartbeat is, no, I want to spend eternity with you. But you're free to reject me if you want to. You're free to throw the grace of God and you're free to throw the cross away. You're free to throw the eternal life gift that I give you in Jesus away if you want. But it doesn't change my heart. God wants to spend eternity with you. This is why Jesus lived the life that he did. Why he built margins in his life where he wasn't stressed, where he wasn't pushed himself right to the edge. Because he wanted to have time to sit with people and talk with people because he had an eternal perspective and he knew that God wanted to spend eternity with people. And he also knew that there was something to look forward to. Now, I don't know about you, this is my little personal confession, but growing up as a kid, uh, heaven wasn't something I really looked forward to. And, and maybe it was because the way I heard about heaven was like in a Sunday school class with the flannel board. Anybody else remember those little things? And we had the little cloud and the angel with the harp and like grapes. There are a lot of grapes evidently in heaven that are there. And, and so I'm looking at that. I'm like, man, that looks boring to me. I'm not sure I want to go. If you're just singing around on a cloud, singing music with a harp, I'm not sure that's really what I want to do for eternity. And if that was your understanding of what heaven is, man, you're about ready to get your mind blown because that is not at all what heaven looks like. Heaven is the perfect perfection of God that we finally get to see the creator of the universe face to face and look into his eyes and see the glory of God and experience that forever. And there's no more pain or sorrow. There's no more terror that we have to live with. There is nothing that can come in the way of our relationship with God. There is perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. And Jesus says, I know there's something to look forward to. This is why I can get through life um, today when there's a difficult day, because I know this goes away pretty quickly. (laughs) But eternity, oh, just wait until you see what eternity is going to look like. And so as he describes the end of the earth, Peter writes these words. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, you ought to live holy and godly lives and look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. For that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. How do you look forward to that? Because, man, if this is what God could put together, you've probably seen some glorious things if I have, if you've traveled anywhere in this world. 
You've seen some miraculous, glorious things. Talking to astronauts, they're like, man, I just get my mind blown every time I go out into space and see the vastness of space and that God created all this. If God put this together in six days, what do you think he's doing when this heaven and this earth disappear and God comes back and there's a new heaven and a new earth? What do you suppose that one looks like, huh? You suppose that's going to be just a little bit better than what we got here? No, it's going to be a lot better. It's going to blow our minds when we get into the presence and the holiness of God. Which is why the psalmist wrote this, Teach us to number our days so that we can gain a heart of wisdom. And let me tell you what this doesn't mean. What this doesn't mean is, God, give me the number. Like, how long do I have to live to 80 years, 75, do I 50, 40? You know, well, how many days? So I can multiply the years by 365, and then I can figure out how many days i got to live. And then when I know those days are coming to an end, I can start getting really serious about you. That's not what that, this means. Because the word for um, number in Hebrew is mana. Mana. The plural for that is mana mana, uh, just in case you want to know. That really killed with my four-year-old. She was like, ah, just dying. It was hilarious for her. Mana. And mana literally means wait. And so what this means is teach us to wait our days. In other words, where do you want to put the wait? Is it on this that's very temporal or on the eternal? And boy, you put those things on a scale. There is no comparison. Lord, teach us to wait our days. So we can have this heart of wisdom. So I'm, I'm living in light of eternity, knowing that you want to spend eternity with me forever. And there is something to look forward to. God, let me put that on the scale so I don't put all my weight on this right here and right now. This is why I love this Andy Stanley quote. I um, found this a number of years ago, and I just love this. My time is limited, so I'm going to limit what I do with my time. Man, this is so temporary here, so I'm not going to get wrapped up in the urgent. Just because somebody says it's urgent, it needs to happen right now, I'm not going to get caught up in that because my time is limited. I want to limit what I do with my time. So I'm going to be very intentional about this. I'm going to build some margins in my life. So when things come and God tells me, hey, I want you to do this, I've got some room to do that. So I can sit down and talk to people, not be looking at my watch and my phone going off and wondering where I'm supposed to be next. I'm going to limit what I do with my time. I think the best description of this is in Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a prophet of God, and he was going back into Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. And there were some enemies outside of Jerusalem who didn't want those walls rebuilt because Jerusalem was basically a piggy bank, and they could just go in and take whatever they wanted and leave. And so Nehemiah comes in, he's rebuilding the walls, and these enemies are doing everything they can to thwart um, Nehemiah's focus on rebuilding this wall. And so they're coming time and time again and trying to distract him. And here's what Nehemiah says in Nehemiah 6. I'm carrying on a great project, and I I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? And I love that. My time is limited. I'm going to limit what I do with my time. I'm doing a great work here. This is important. This is what God has called me to do. I'm not getting distracted by your urgency just because you're shouting or because you're loud. I'm going to say no. That's a complete sentence. No. <laughs> I don't have to just it. No. I'm doing a great work. Why should the work stop while I leave and go down to you? Before we moved here, my wife was um, the uh, acting dean and was going to be moving in that position before we came here for Concordia University in Irvine, California. And as a dean, as you can imagine, as you have a lot of people, a lot of people wanted her time, and and I don't fault them for that. She's absolutely brilliant, and they like picking her brain on different things. But she would often get frustrated because she goes, man, I've, I've got these important things that I need to get done, and only I can get these things done. And it seems like I'm spending so much of my time sort of wasting, trying to put out these little fires along the way. And so I shared this verse with her, and she loved this verse, and she put this verse up on her door. Not the whole thing printed out just Nehemiah 6 3 now not a lot of people have memorized Nehemiah 6 3 and so people would come to her door and like hey what's Nehemiah 6 3 she goes look it up and come back to me and like so they'd look it up and come back oh <laughs> so do you have something worth like wild time or are you just trying to kill time here because I got a very important thing I'm trying to do here and I can't just drop everything every time you have an issue that's going on she'd said it a lot nicer than I would but that's why I married up <laughs> because I'm not very good at that. So um, all that to, to say this, I hope your um, work isn't looking like the video we had earlier. And frankly, I hope your home life, if you have a home life, doesn't look like this family. Man, that's your idea of quality family time. Everybody doing their own little thing in their own little world and not paying attention to each other. That's not the way God intended us to live. 
And so because I want to give you something really practical uh, to do today, I want to give you this. In your worship folder, there's a little card that looks like this. And what I want to do is give you a homework assignment. And what I want you to do is not do it right now, um, just because some of you are type A and driven. I'm going to get it done now so I can check it off the little box and be done. Um, I, want, I want you to think about it, frankly. And I want you to not think about it during the break at football, like, oh, I got a commercial. Let me take that thing out right now so I can get it done. And I don't want you to do it on your way in next week because you feel guilty. Oh, shoot, I forgot. Where's that little car? Let me fill that out in a real big hurry and get done. No, I want you to take some time this week. Develop some margins so you can think and pray over this car. Now, on this car, there's the four symbols. And the plus stands for things that you want to add. So in light of what you heard today, in light of eternity and the fact that God wants eternity with you and the fact that eternity is something to look forward to, what are some things that you need to add into your life? Now, about six months into uh, our daughter's birth when we lived in California, my daughter, um, and still doesn't, doesn't like to sleep, didn't nap at all, was up all the time. And my wife and I are older parents. And so already we didn't have, we had the, you know, we have a little bit more wisdom than like 20-year-old parents do, but we didn't have the energy the 20-year-old parents do. And so both of us, we just like exhausted. And I can remember one particular Saturday morning and we're just both looking at each other and looking over on the wall was a picture from our engagement. And I looked at that picture. I'm like, that seems like decades ago. (laughs) Like, you know, when we used to have life in our eyes and like a smile and like everything was great. I had hair. It was wonderful. And then I remembered this, this uh, survey I read. The psychologist had done some research. And what he found is that everybody needs a four-hour block of time every week. And the four-hour block of time means that you don't have any responsibility as a spouse, as a parent, as an employee. You just get to do whatever it is that you need to do that brings life back to you. So if you like golfing, go golfing. You like fishing, go fishing. You want to go for a walk, go for a walk. You want to take a nap, take a nap, whatever it is. And I looked at my wife, and and she looked a lot like I did, just exhausted. (laughs) And I looked at her and said, honey, why don't you just go away for four hours? And she looked at me and she goes, you might die if I leave you for four hours. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, but we're both going to die if we don't do something different. So just go. And so she went and she went and got some coffee, went to a bookstore, read some books and got her toes done, got her hairs done. And I wish I would have done a before and after picture, um, but she wouldn't have let me put it up anyway. So I don't have a before and after picture. But she came back and she looked like a completely different woman. And so from that moment on, we said, you know, we're giving each other a four hour block of time every single week. Because eventually, like Monday would roll around, we're already exhausted and it's Monday. And, but we knew Saturday was coming, and Saturday each of us got four hours so we could just go and do whatever we wanted to do that would bring life back into our life. That was our plus. Um, a minus, one of the things you want to do, and that could be a lot of things that you just need to take out of your life. A long time ago, I used to subscribe to the newspaper, and I loved reading the sports section, the comics, and figure out what's going on in the news. But then I, I sort of dawned on me what I was doing is I'd get all that done first, and then, um, oh, I got a few minutes. Let me do my devotions real quick before I go to work. And like, even as a pastor, like, man, that is about as shallow as you can possibly get in. It was just confronted by that. I thought, you know what? I can't deal with the temptation of having a paper because even if I do my devotions first, I'm going to be thinking about, I want to have enough time to read the whole paper. So I just took out the paper. I canceled my subscription, done. And that was a great move spiritually for me because then it just freed up a whole bunch of time and margin for me to be able to say, "I I want that time, just quietness with God. Greater than, what are things that I need to increase in my life to bring the quality of my life better? How can I do that? What are some things that I need to decrease in my life? They're not necessarily bad that I need to take out, but I need less of that in my life. And so I want you to take some time and wrestle with this because here's the benefit of it. When you do that, when you have some time to put some margins in your life. What that does is is keeps you from bumping up against your limit because that's really the definition of margin and Pastor Tim does such a great job last week of setting us up well because at the extreme, your limit is where that's as far as you can go and for time, it's 24 hours. That's all you get. And then the margin is the space in between your present pace and your limit. And so all we're asking you to do is be intentional about building some margin back into your life so that when God speaks to you, you have time to hear him speak to you, that you have time like Jesus to engage in conversation with people, that you have time to care for people that need to be cared for, that we have time to be the people of God that God calls us to be.